we were talking about uh, Debian before, right? You know, Mint. Say that one more time. We were talking about Mint and Debian and stuff like that. Yeah, before. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, I don't like Ubuntu. I do like the Debian core. Uh, I, I prefer Arch, honestly. Uh, I, I, my favorite distro PC uses RPMs, but it, it's... Is PC Linux awesome? Yeah. I, I like PC Linux. It, it just works, damn it. And it does just work, damn it. It's, which is a good thing. I haven't used them in a long time, and I kind of start stopped liking them because I don't like the day. I don't know, it's just like too much too <laughs> PC Linux OS. It sounds like you know, it's like a Microsoft word, like Windows Phone Mobile Seven. You know what I mean? Like some long name that's compiled into it. <laughs> I don't know, it's picky, I mean... I, I, I call it PC Lin and move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like saying GPL slash Linux slash, you know, Herb slash uh, QT and Oh, yeah, people get a little carried away on some of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I like Debian too, but... I don't know, the thing with Ubuntu is that they make it so easy. They have so many, so many people, so, so much support, you know what I mean? Uh, well, okay, but it, it, that's coming at a price. There's a, I mean, hell, I just got, I basically was told I hate Linux. A, a lot, th there's a growing thing, and it's kind of at the core of free versus open. A Linux lug told me I hate Linux because I don't prefer some of the choices Canonical makes for Ubuntu. Yeah, I'm complete, I mean, before, let's see, before 10.04, I believe, I was happy with like 9.10 when they had the orange colors basically. Like Ubuntu was like revolving around the people, you know, it was the community and stuff, and Canada was just like supporting them. But now it's like a corporate so Corporations are doing it and the people are just there, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is similar to what's happening to this country. Now this country is like, yeah, we could call ourselves a republic, but it's corporate art. I don't hate the companies, um, it, it's, uh, but I'm not sure you could argue. There's a growing number of people who want the United States to be a democracy. And but I, it's representative democracy. Uh, no, they want, it to be, uh, they want it to be a democracy. You mean like a, like a majoritarian, like direct democracy where everybody votes on every issue? Yes. They want the, 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 I, I, I agree, and there's a reason we're a Republican. It doesn't change the fact that uh, the, the, one of the growing political arguments I keep hearing in the country right now is, um, you know, we have, to, we have to make the United States a democracy again. I missed the memo. When was it ever a democracy? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's a I've experienced... Uh, the electoral college at all levels, from the precinct to the county to the state level. I, don't know, I think I, I think the constitution needs to be rewritten. Really? Yeah, I think well, like I'm not, I'm not saying to throw it out. I'm saying take it and just say, okay, we're living in 2011. What are the current problems, and how do we adapt to it? I no no. I don't think the constitution needs to be rewritten. I don't think there's anything wrong with the Constitution. I don't think anything's yeah, wrong at all. Wait, 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 I still haven't finished because I don't agree either. I, 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 okay, well, since I've already inserted my mouth and opened, um, I was going to say, honestly, I, I think what needs to happen, there's a divide in this country. There's people who think the United States has gone astray, who think it needs to become yada yada, and there's people who thinks the United States has gone astray, who thinks it needs to become yada yada yada. By the way, I started the recording again. Uh, um, but um, I personally uh, would love to see both sides do what uh, the second Congress did, and that is the same thing the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists did. Uh, I agree there's a disagreement in the United States today about what the core values and rights of the citizens are. In other words, what are people entitled to? Right, so I think we should sit down and basically hammer out a Bill of Rights too. You know, uh, an, an additional amendments that are uh, what the uh, people of today think are the the sovereign liberties of Americans. That's the thing. That's the thing. I was telling Marcel. I don't know if I, I told Marcel, but FDR's uh, second Bill of Rights in 1944. Oh boy. Oh boy. Here we go. That one's loaded. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, 
I don't want to change the Constitution. Because it's basically, guys, look. The United States is not unlike many other countries. Like, for instance, when, when, when we're discussing income, income ability, when income ability is compared, you've got to take what the unemployment is and how much poor a country actually has in its, its per capita GDP. The reason why I said lower income ability in the United States means that we have more wealth. We have, we have more richer people. How? Yeah. How? Oh, oh my God. God! The people that are poor. <laughs> we still do have poor, but our, our population ratio of how much poor we have is lower. The most good. That means we have an average low income ability versus countries that have high unemployment ratios. I don't understand have, how that. I don't understand how that works because income ability is when your family or the individual progresses over time. But I mean, if we have wait, 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 that's right, that's right. If you are if you are rich and you and you, and you have a certain amount of wealth, which we are trying to make a common denominator in the United States, which has to do with assets of loss. In other words, you lose assets to regain them. That's a measurement of income ability. In other words, we, as the United States, have acquired so much. That's what the rest of the world bitches at us, at us anyway about. They're like, you have too much in the United States. You guys need to be like the rest of us because you have too much. That's right. That's why our income ability versus yours is lower because we have less to move. We have less that have lost. I don't understand. So you're saying that the income ability is low because we're already good? We have, and in many parts, yes, versus the world. Hell yes, sir, then we are we are very good in much comparison to the rest of the world. Now, if you want to take Kuwait or Finland, which are are what I call um, uh, homogeneous economies, which solely exist on one export, like, for instance, Kuwait, they have a higher per capita GDP, per, per GDP uh, than we do. Why? They're an extremely uh, wealthy, oil-rich nation. They have so much in exports, that their GDP scale, if you were to take GDP and measurement of exports, is like way out the window. Same thing with many other countries that do specialization. Not many countries do that. Also, if your population is smaller and the homogeneous versus the diversity that exists in this country, huh, it's far easier to maintain a consistent demographic. Because the culture is the same, it, it, it exerts the same variables to contain with. Versus if you introduce more of a heterogeneous variable, it becomes a bigger mathematical equation to handle. So those it's like the state the state education that we were dealing with, it's the exact same analogy. Oh, why does Vermont have such a high education rate on this four year graduation rate? Well let's let's take a look at the statistics. Vermont only lists two categories, white and native Indian. Woohoo! They have to deal with fucking two demographics. Whereas English is a second language in any of that crap. Of course they have a higher freaking education rate. They're dealing with the homo uh, homogenous demographic of two categories. Now let's go to California and Texas, in which Texas versus California, we're graduating more Hispanics than they are. I mean, this is insane when we start saying, oh, well, there's so much in income disparity, blah, 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 in the United States. And then, yes, because you can go, you know why our income disparity is so great in this country? Because we have the richest freaking people in this country that create a schasm curve that if you can be that rich, you can fall to the bottom level. In other countries where their richest person is X variable, you don't, your fall from grace is not that great. So income disparity, even if you want to use that false variable, which is, what is, the, what is the poor of 1997 and what is the poor of 2003? And they are not the same poor. They are not the same people. And they, and actually, the pie that has been chipped away from the income has increased from previous year to the increased year. It would be a problem if the pie chunk that the that the poor in let's say 1997 is not the same as 2003. Then we have to look and say, oh. Well, your actual pie, the pie didn't even increase for you, for your sliver of the pie, and therefore your income didn't even increase at all. That doesn't, that doesn't happen in the United States. But what about the statistics where it says that the rich over the last, let's say, 10, 20 years, their profits have skyrocketed like 450%, while the, the poor are going down. They're not, they're not growing even that close to that rate. You mean the UK? No, US. Here's the US. 
Uh, all right, show me show me a statistic of, and what's based on because I can guarantee you there's going to be a fallacy in mathematical problem. That's because we stumbled across this in, in, in my economic theory on how things are measured, and people like to take oh look at the port here and they don't even they don't even measure on what does that actually mean when you say it's 1997 and 2003, and then what has happened? It's like well no, and what they're doing there is like you're saying with the poor. We say, uh, like one of the numbers we love to look at is the richest 400. We say the richest, the, the uh, wealth controlled by the richest 400 went from blah to blah to blah to blah. Yeah. Now, when, if you're talking about the richest 400, we have this great thing called the Forbes list where we can go, okay, are they the same 400 assholes? Oh! Not only that, wait a minute, you're going to get a corporate. Not only that, in this, in this past recession, we've lost more rich people than anything in this country that have lost their wealth. We've also and had some people move yeah. up considerably. They, they Zuckerberg joined the richest 400 list. Yeah, that's life. my point of income disparity. It's because the United States houses the most richest people ever. On uh, actually, uh, before, so before somebody before, before somebody rips you a new one, I'm going to point it out. The richest person in, a, in the world is not an American. No, I know. You're going to get to a monarchy. In Kuwait, no, no. The richest person in America is this uh, investor. He invests in real estate or whatever. I, I, I think his his country of origin is Mexico, but I don't think he actually lives. Hey, what I'm getting at is, yes, there are rich people like the monarchies and all this in Kuwait. And all, and that, look, what I'm talking, on average, our schism is more extreme because we house that extreme. I would rather have that than saying... In another country, well, the richest you can get is this, and the poorest you can get is this. Hell no. Then that's actually leading to dumbing down the population and making it equally poor. I don't want that. I, what, I'm, what I want is mass wealth accumulation for a larger pool, meaning that the people that are actually mobile, which isn't that interesting, the people with the highest income mobility or economic mobility are the poor because they have no assets. And they move up to gain assets. And so what we're saying is that we want we want a country that has people that lose assets as fast as they can gain them. Hell no, we want stability. But the, want thing is, the, the thing is that you see a mass accumulation of wealth, but the the wealth is accumulating; it's just accumulating at the top. And no, that's not true. true. That's not true. true. I mean, it's, 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 it's proof otherwise. They're not they're rich. They're not they're rich. rich. Sorry. They're not doing it. They're accumulating the wealth and they're investing it in foreign oh, wealth. And no, wealth. what's happening? What's happening in this country is that we are. Uh, what, 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 you are not looking at it correctly. What, what is happening in this country is we're creating more rich people. When we have more rich people. That means... Oh, no, no, but, but that, more money. rich people is bad. They need to give it up and help the poor people. That that big house they're in, they need to move out of it. But uh, that's, You're being sarcastic, yeah. When we create more wealth and, and more assets for all, your income mobility goes down because less people are mobile. That means you have a more st stable government. And it makes sense, Jonathan. Take the, wait a minute. Take the unemployment in those countries. Their unemployment is much higher, and what happens is they have a higher turnaround rate. Of course, they're going to have a higher unemployment because their cycle, their cycle of taking from rich to poor because of the unemployment rate, which is saying they have a disparity of saying we have a larger group to move. Well, I don't, I don't care. So. If the, I don't care if the rich are rich, and I don't care if the rich have money. They're entitled to their money, right? Because they work hard for it. The yes. thing is, though, that what they're not investing in really, this country. They're investing in foreign countries. And on top of that, no, you know, it's not, not true. God damn, there's so many sound bites coming out of that. But go ahead and finish. How's the sound bites? Look at China's economy, look at India's economy. Wait a minute, China's economy has nothing to do with what we're investing. Wait, That's no. a and then and then Republicans say we need to deregulate and let business regulate themselves because it's that. That's the reason that they're leaving the country. That's the reason they're outsourcing. It's because there's so many regulations. To me, that sounds like you're saying, okay, well, businesses want That's to help our United States citizens, so that we're just going to country. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. All right. China's profit doesn't come from, like, individuals saying, I'm moving my money to China. No. The discrepancy that we have with China is, like, which I actually argue against. I went to an economy. I, I, I'd rather talk about the deregulation. I thought that's what you were going to get into. But I'm going to get to it. I actually argued this 
uh, with an, an economic professor when I was still in college, and I was saying, look, when we have trade balances that stipulate a certain deficit, let's, let, this is kind of a fictional number in terms that of what has happened in history, essentially. When we move, and China picks up the slack for American consumer surplus, of which that is totally about, China is rich based upon American surplus consumption, is that we do not import as many goods as that, as that we, of what they, of what we buy from them, which creates a deficit, a deficit for them, or a deficit for us in terms of how we trade goods for money. Our money goes out to them because our consumers are buying the products because we want those products. You cannot tell me that you have somehow equivocated that process to like Republican capitalists, which is, I know, the, the belief that saying, I'm moving my money to China. Hell no. I argued against any kind of professor and saying much of what the United States does because of regulation, which is true, is saying it is, it, it, for me, the, the American consumer says, I want this product at X price. For me to achieve that, I have to go to this place in order to do that. Now, let's talk, I'm going to talk about that whole cycle. I'm going to talk about that whole cycle, so don't interrupt me. So what they're saying is that we're talking about the poor who are saying, I can't afford products. The supplier is saying, I know you can't afford those products. I need to do something about it so that you can because I want to make money off of you. So how do I go about giving you products that you can afford? Well, gee, if I, if I abide by U.S. law and regulations, it costs me X dollars to output this product, and therefore it is out of your price range because the United States is diluted in saying if I supply all of these regulations in the labor force, It'll somehow make them richer as an individual, which only, which I have repeatedly said to Jonathan, translates to the consumer and saying, I am now priced out of that product, which means the, the company is saying, well, gee, you can't have that product. I am now limited to a certain demographic of people that have a certain per capita GDP. What, how can I increase my volume? I need to make my product cheaper. I can't do that in the United States because they're living by this fictional rule of if I increase the labor output ratio of benefits, entitlements, and pay, somehow that's going to make that they, they can afford the products, which, no, it creates an exponential cycle of pricing out the very people that you're trying to empower. So the, pro the company then goes to another company or another country that says, wow, I have now been. I have. I am now able to exhaust X amount percentage from the cost of my product that now the consumers in America will buy because they're going to. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So then, that company is now saying, "Wait a minute." And what happens to China is that they're not investing in China. China. That sole apparatus exists in China to satisfy American consumption. That should actually be counted as GMP because the sole existence of the company in China is for the sole purpose of to, of to supply American surplus demand. So if that well, is Well, and that, that, that's actually proven by something, a lot of people, this doesn't get talked about in the news that much anymore, but something that is known is when the little bubble popped over here in 08, and basically, Americans stopped exporting a shitload of crap from China. China got hit almost as hard as us. And, yeah, and, 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 and yeah, and China has started to realize, you know what? Maybe we don't want our primary thing dependent on exporting to. You can't think about it. That's the point. Is that you? Don't, and that's why I've always said the day that I will worry about American economy is the day that another country can outdo our consumer pool. The entire point of economics is, is consumption. The entire point of everything that we come out to be is consuming. If you do not have the largest consumer pool and you degradate your population to prohibit consumption, you are not a player. That means whole countries export and it can exist for the sole purpose of American consumption. And that is very true today. Countries exist by the sole exportation that exists for their GDP because of American consumption. That employs them in their country and gives them a purpose, which, hey, it may be very shitty over there and we can interject human rights and all that, 
But then I would project those human faults on that country for not empowering their own consumers to consuming their own goods in their own country. How dare you, dictator? How dare you limit the power of your individual as a consumer in making your stupid ass ridiculous laws and not empowering your people? The second you make a consumer pool, you increase your wealth, you increase your ability to provide services for consumers. And guess what, Jonathan? I can I have the ability and surplus to provide services even if they are poor because the money exists so in my economy that if you are poor, I can do it at, an, at a very far less expense than would bankrupt me and, and creates care in the population. But that's what, I was gonna, that's what I was gonna tell you, that you have these businesses that are going overseas. That I'm not saying that they're investing in China because they love China. Obviously, they're corporations, they wanna make money, that's the point, right? But they're going over there and they're basically exploiting the hell out of their employees and they're paying them really low. But of course, if you could pay- Wait well, a minute. No, 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 that, that's something to take into account. Like, uh, there are p the people go, there are places in the world where it's like, these people don't even make a dollar a day. Okay, I, to even put that number in perspective, I want to know, well, I can't live on a dollar a day in the U.S. Really, you need about 5 to 20. Uh, but how many dollars a day does it cost to live there? Because if somebody's making 75 cents a day and it costs them 25 cents a day to live, then well, they're making a hell of a lot better than me. <laughs> but, 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 it does happen. Well, let me explain what happens. They don't have the actual employees, John. The company oh, I, looks... I, I, I understand that. It's not the same thing. I mean, you could, you might need $1,500 in the United States to live, but then in China, I think you need like $200 to $300. Wait a minute. But I want to I wanna make a caveat to that. That's not what I'm talking about. You said oh. the company goes over to China and, and pays its employees. Like, no, they don't. Well, how it works in China, especially because China is regulated, is that there are services already, service-oriented companies that they already have their labor force in place. And what they do is they bid for your product. It's not the other way around. You don't go there and you say, I'm going to hire my own. No, 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 no. Not in China. In fact, that's almost impossible to do in China. Do you no, well, not exactly. Not exactly because I China said almost. There are companies that have managed to get there and done it. Walmart's one of them. Right. Yeah, China is very much like the United States. They have, oh, they have, oh they, have, I know. they have a division between private and public sector. And the thing is with the private sector is that it, it started. The United States tends to be more private sector than public sector. China is the opposite. They tend to be more public sector than private sector. But the thing with the private sector is that the public sector people, they basically vote on saying, okay, we have this public sector, we have this land. Right, but do we want to make it privatized? Once everybody votes on that and they agree, it becomes private sector. Well, let me let me let me say why it's different. In China. It's when not the same, one, but it's very different. And I'll, and I'll explain why. The when a company does go over to China, they have to abide by the bid process of the service company that's going to help, help do their product. Now, shame on us! Shame on us, American consumers who want cheap products on the backs of other human beings that get paid seventy-five cents a day. No. It does cost more to live in China than what you were saying. China exists because they have free zones that they exploit. They yeah, feed, the wait a minute, wait a minute. They, they feed the communist machine. China has slave labor. And never forget that. When you have slave labor, as many, uh, as many other countries do, you cannot equivocate or come anywhere near a moral equivalency to the United States. It is illegal in this country that we have a de common denominator of paying out for what the labor resource unit is equated to in value. When you are a country that has quote unquote free trade zones and the majority of your country is revolting against you and despises you and tries their best to get rid of you and you enslave them for a dollar a day because you dictate their wages by saying you can, we will either burn your town and mow you down with our bullshit China-made AK center fires, and, or you abide by it five cents a day. That is it. Slave labor is slave labor. Whole empires can exist for long periods of time. Why? Because they don't deal with the labor coefficient. The labor coefficient is something the United States has embraced equally. It is a mathematical problem that is the most cumbersome in economics. In economics, if you can say you are a slave, what have you just done? 
You have just made a resource non-scarce, meaning you have removed what is needed for real economics. You have made it easy. No, you, you've you removed something for... Um, the, 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 there's more than one economic model. There's the one you subscribe to. That's one of the things. I, 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 and that goes back to uh, something John made at the beginning. You well, your know, axiom is that your economics model is the only valid one. Wait a minute. I don't have an axiom. Prove to me. I'm, I'm using logic. You're, you are actually countering a slave model as an economic model. How, how can that be? You do have axioms. Austrian school is completely based on axioms. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, I don't want to say it's self-evident because I try, I disagree with the Austrian school as well, Jonathan, on, 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 on many things. What I'm saying is that we cannot say China is United States nor base their model on the United States because they have a variable that we do not contend with. They eliminate a scarcity, which is labor in their country. Well, and, well the, the thing is, wow. We have to go back to Mao Zedong. When Mao Zedong, uh, you know, created the Communist Party and all of these things, he, he completely took over everything. He took over the economy. But after Mao Zedong and after the what is it, Great Leap Forward, which was a yeah. back yeah. for for China, when uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, actually, Deng Xiaoping, well, Jonathan, do you know how many people he murdered in in doing that? Uh, uh, okay, yes. not to be a cynic or anything. But just because it's a rule that doesn't exist in your model, and I happen to prefer your model to the model that allows those types of things, it doesn't mean the model isn't valid. It means the model <laughs> operates on a different set of rules. Rusty, if we're going to debate economics, now if you want to debate philosophy, I will engage you. But if you're going to say it's an economic model, we must understand economics. The basis of economics is that all things are scarce and inequality. That's why we have economics. Now. If you remove the scarcity, we are not discussing economics, we are discussing philosophy. So if you want to say that Mao Zedong had a philosophy, fine. That is a Wait. philosophical model. That is not an economic model. Well, well, the thing I was going to ask was about China and the United States, okay? Well, after Mao Zedong, with Deng Xiaoping, uh, I think he took over the Communist Party because him and, and Zedong had a lot of differences. Yes. Yao basically turned China into a socialistic, uh, well, a social market economy. That's what he did. He, he had a market. But Zedong didn't believe in a market. He believed in total control of everything. So now China has a, mar a model much more like the United States. Before, they didn't have that at all. it has free zones. Do not confuse what China has. China has a specific pockets of regions that they call free zones. That is not their economic topology. If you were actually in China and they were to say that to them, you would be expelled from their country. I guarantee you, because I have a personal friend who used to audit Chinese companies and was kicked out of their country because he was trying to trace too many uh, accrual accounting facets of, of many companies there. But I, have, but I, have a, I have a Chinese friend too, and he was actually my economics teacher. He was telling me that China's economy is their their their, their government is communist, but their their economy is very capitalist. No, it's not. How can he say that? I, would you email your economic professor? They have free zones. That is it. And their economy for the majority of the country, good God, that would be fantastic if their economic model was capitalistic for the majority of their country. They have a small amount of free zones, and that is it. The rest of the country and the people that are dying and revolting against their, their, their government would love it if it were truly true what you just said. They would, they would good God, man, it is such a, it is, my goodness, China has very few free trade zones that people participate in. And, and we're going to attribute their whole country to that. Oh, you have a capitalistic model? Oh, hell no. They allow it. Why? Because it, it, they go, oh, we can make money. That fuels our communist machine. And while the majority of the country suffers in this slave labor, they cover it up. And nobody gives a shit because nobody fucking goes there. You know, it's, like, it's, it's the most disgusting situation I've ever seen in my life. What about in the, in the, in the developed uh, parts of China, like Shanghai and... Uh, okay. and the now, the developed West. parts of China are called free zones. That is correct. If you do, and you are lucky to live there, Jonathan, good. Good. Right. That's so great. That, so that's what I was telling you. That's what I was telling you before, that the parts that are getting exploited are the rural areas, where people are not educated. And, and, there's a and that's the majority of people. And they are slave labor. We don't have slave labor in this country. See, China can resolve this problem by saying, we need to build this infrastructure, we need to build this road, we need to build this dam, 
Do you think they go to the people in the free trade zone, or do you, they, they go to the people in the rural and, 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 the, and the majority of China? They go to the well, people in the majority of China. Who built the Olympics stadium? Was it the free trade zone, or was it the people that got paid a dollar fifty a day as slave labor? <laughs> well, you do have slave labor in the United States. It's just very right. low. Oh bullshit! There is oh. no fucking. There is no <laughs> fucking. <laughs> <slave labor. laughs> The thing with the slave labor in the United States is that it's low, it's like 50,000, but at the same time, there are tactics that corporations are using. Oh, oh that's just bullshit, dude. In order to reinforce the business. No, 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 no. I'll, say, I'll send you the information. I totally disagree. There is no slave labor in this. Now, if you want to say that I work five months out of the year to pay taxes, okay, I, 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 I can say a lot of it. Because, see, my aim is I will pay taxes to help people. What I'm saying is that there's too much waste at the national level. What I'm saying is that I want to help my fellow man. And the way to do that is to get to the most efficient variable known. And we are not anywhere near that. By, by when did you become a Zionist? <laughs> what? A what? Uh, whatever the hell they call him. The... Zeitgeist? I'm not a Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist has nothing to do with this philosophy. <laughs> That's the whole point behind Zeitgeist. They think if technology is exercised efficiently enough that um, scarcity can be overcome. I'm not saying scarcity can overcome. No, no, no. That's what I'm saying. It's not. No, I, no. That that's the thing, Marcel. You're 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 arguing. That's why we're going back to the axiom thing. You, you, I, I don't necessarily disagree with under. Wait, 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 no, 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 no. You're totally off. They have eradicated scarcity. I didn't. Uh, scarcity is going to exist in the states. What I'm saying is that by making it at a federal, what I'm saying is that a scarcity level at a larger exponential variable cannot address it. In other words, if I have a global variable in JavaScript versus a, a local variable within a function, wait, can you repeat that? Because uh, you you pulled me back in the conversation. Right. <laughs> but what I'm saying, well, yeah, what I'm saying is that if I have a global variable. Right. That is cast for all. It can become confusing, combodulated, versus if I have a local variable declared within a function that I use specifically for a task and function. I am not saying scarcity goes away. Scarcity is going to exist at the state level. But you know what? The voters of that state can best decide how that scarcity can be politically managed when they elect the politicians versus a national level. That is what I'm getting at. I am not anywhere near as I guys. I admit there's a scarcity at the fucking city level. There's a scarcity at my HOA level. I'm an HOA president. And I have to deal with inequalities. What I'm saying is that if we allow it to become more specific to what the problem is, that the demographics vote in a representative economy as such what we have, because politicians dictate really what the economy is, we can better address our problems versus putting all our weight at the national level. I agree with you on that, which is basically what I said about people in like the neighborhoods and stuff like that. They all talk to each other and resolve the problem because they live there. That's basically what you're trying to say. Yes. And, and, and it's not zeitgeist. But what I'm saying is that you can become more efficient on the same variables of saying it is still scarce, but guess what? The variables that I have to contend with exponentially are far less because I've made it more specific. That's what I'm saying, Rusty. Zeitgeist makes an assumption. I did not make an assumption. I did no, you, you make an assumption that uh, the pro <laughs> you 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 know no no I'm gonna uh, okay let me tell you what your assumption is. Your assumption is that the problem is impossible to solve. Correct. Okay, yes. that's an assumption. Well, it, it is impossible to solve because I, it, we, until somebody can make things infinite at all levels, you can't solve it. That's what I'm saying. It's an now. engineering problem that doesn't make it, just because nobody's figured out how to do it doesn't make it impossible. Okay. I agree as long as the problem isn't solved. Now, now you're on crack. Okay. Oh, actually, actually, you have a point on something because that's what I was trying to get to, uh, to you across before. That's one of the reasons that I don't know about Austrian economics because they make this axiom that oh, there's too many variables, therefore we shouldn't we shouldn't dabble in any of them because I mean we can't always. I, 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 I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. What I am saying is that it is indisputable. I'm not. This is not an axiom. Then you prove to me otherwise that re, that the entire that for instance 
we, you're going to prove to me that we can consume equally, that we can distribute equally, that we can actually derive raw materials equally? Nonsense. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. This is not an axiom. This is empirically backed. <laughs> no, your assumption is that it's impossible under any means to ever achieve enough. Well, wait a minute. Are you saying that we can achieve eventually, like, let's say in Star Trek, we give, we granted that we can achieve replicators if we and... Get a replicator, yeah. Like stem cell research. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to... I'm not denying that, but, but didn't Jonathan pin me down so many times and saying we have people that are dying now, that are poor now? I thought the context was about now. Uh, uh, all I'm okay. You, uh, this is funny. You're simultaneously agreeing and disagreeing, which is funny. Your 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 point I can't, of I can't know. What I'm saying is, I exit the argument of the future because I don't pretend to know the future. If 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 we eliminate and not through slave labor, let me just put it that way. If we eliminate scarcities, then more power to us. And then and guess what? We exit the economic discussion. With each scarcity that we eliminate... Uh, okay, that right there, that what you just said is the axiom. Your axiom is that it ceases to be an economy of any kind the moment you solve that problem. Correct. Okay, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not your economy. It is still a form of economics. That's, that, that's the point we've been trying to convey. No, resting. Economics, you know what I always just call the dismal science? Economics solely exists because we have scarcity. If you remove scarcity, you are no longer in economics. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go look up the definition. Look it up right now. And it, economics is about distribution of scarcity. Period. If we don't have scarcity, we are not discussing economics. I'm sorry. Look it up. That's what it is. I have a whole fucking degree in economics. The whole point of the degree Without this is like arguing the English language with an English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look it up. Now, if we want to discuss and say philosophically we should be here, fine. Oh, oh okay, okay, I, wait a minute. Uh, the, but the latter part, consumption, you're telling me there would be no consumption of any kind if there was... The I didn't say consumption. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait I, a I'm minute. looking at definitions. Economics is about scarcity, not it's not about consumption. It's not even about production. Uh, not according to this definition I'm looking at. What definition are you looking at? Okay, the definition, the sign, and, and let me read the whole definition before you sign. You are obsessed with one word in the definition. The definition, the science that deals with, and this is a list, so it's it should it could be real. The science that deals with the production production of goods and services. The science that deals with the distribution of goods and services. The distribution aspect has to do with the scarcity aspect. The science that deals with consumption of goods and services. Even if you get rid of the scarcity where you don't need an economic model to deal with distribution of goods, you're still going to have production and consumption. Okay. Which is at economics. Point, wait a minute. At that point, I would be honest with you. Come on, let's be let's be frank. At that point, the Austrian school becomes moot. Keynesian becomes moot because everything is about the dispersal. Because we have scarce resources at all levels, whether it's consumption, logistics, and the raw material itself. It, it, at that point, that's why I'm saying all the all the economic schools of thought would just go well, replicate more. I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> essentially that's what it would be. Don't laugh. What, that's what the argument would be. <laughs> you go to an economic school of thought and say, "I have poor," and the, and the economic school is going to say, "Well, what is scarce and what is infinite?" Okay. Uh, uh, well, actually, if you live, in, if okay, to take the Gene Roddenberry approach, fine. Um, and replicate more, okay. That then becomes the exact opposite problem of scarcity. Telling too much. Yeah, you could have too much of a certain good. Okay. Then you know what? But but at that point, I, I will still say you've left the economic model because the e economics really exists to deal. No, with you've less the you've left the traditional economic model. It's still a form of economics. It's a different economic. You, you're taking you're taking the word Kleenex 
in the Lycan clinics has been done and applied to all patient tissue. <laughs> Look, this is the power. I, this, I have this problem with Austrian economics, which I said before. You know, that they basically think. I agree with you, John. That's right. They do. They, they disavow themselves from all variables because it's too complex. Right, and I, I think I can't use any math. You can't use any statistics. I'm I like, know. I know, and that's wrong. That's wrong. I thought you would have already understood because I give you specifics. I actually try to tackle the problem. I have given you on many occasions in, uh, on, 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 on Twitter and in our, our few Skype conversations specifics on how to tackle them. They may be proven wrong. They may be proven right. Nonetheless, what does that say about me? I believe that we should tackle the economic problem. Right, but before when we were talking about when we were talking about it before, and I give you the example about the ball that we roll on, and we observe the ball and we see what happens, right? And then you're like, well, we shouldn't do that because no, no, oh, 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 oh. It's because I didn't like the arrogance of your friend. Your friend was like, let's roll, let's let's roll the ball, because rolling the ball does have massive consequences in it, and that's what I'm saying. It's like it's like well, you countered with me. You're saying. Okay, Marcelo, you want to have these plans, but we have these people right here and now that could suffer if, if, if it doesn't go well correctly. And that's why I'm agreeing with you. That's why I try to take strategies and what I do propose to you and Rusty that I think would have the less impact in the micro, macro, the here, the now, and the future. Because you're right. I don't want to roll the ball and count everybody as a number. I care about those people. And therefore, I try to make the economic decisions that I do make that are specific in policy, the, 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 the least amount of effect, but try to drive us in the direction. And I have a tremendous time dealing with it because I have to wait. What is the opportunity cost and price of what's of doing this? You know, I'm really beginning to hate that phrase. I didn't used to hate it. Now I'm really starting to hate it. <laughs> yes, you hate that phrase because give me another definition. That's what opportunity cost is. <laughs> It, it, I, I know, but every time you use it, it, it's like listening to somebody say "up is down" because you're because <laughs> you're because you're saying, "Yeah, I, I don't want to quantify things, but I must quantify things. I don't want, to, but I must." But I, it's like, like, yes. like I don't I don't I don't subscribe to an axiom, but my axiom is I'm just I'm like okay, let's wait, count. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have an emotional side. Didn't I not tweet Jonathan that we must? Understand that we have a brain and we also have a heart. Right. Not, that's right. We're always in constant conflict. The second, the second that I lose my heart for compassion, for, and I lose the reason to even contemplate economics, then it's discuss <laughs> anything. Now, now the thing of it is, is that is that an axiom to me, yeah, okay, something is self-evident, but I, I still employ you when it does come to economics. Let's let's prove otherwise. If you're talking about a future consequence, I don't argue that. But I thought, like I said, I thought the context was, and I still, and that's what I just said, is that I have been brought to, okay, what is here and now? And I try to give answers about here and now to lead to the future. If something happens that is unknown to us, how can we even possibly quantify that? Uh, okay, I, that something that is unknown to you and everybody, really, happens every single day in the here and now. True, true. <laughs> Let's be honest with ourselves, though. When more, when when we have the systems that we have with politics, that's what we don't, do. We not argue that it's always the same old, same old. That very little changes. So, which is the int antithesis to what we just discussed? So, that, so, all right. One, do you consider yourself a part of the Austrian school? I subscribe to some of it. Okay. And two, do you do you believe that you can use math? Models, statistics, and other things in order for you to predict things that might happen in the future, in order to you know do a, a counterbalance or whatever. How far in the future? It doesn't. It doesn't so matter for the purpose yes, of that does. question. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> because, because no, look, I did this in economics. My economics degree. The farther out you go, oh crap! Come on, even in a cursive variable. You know that the farther out you, you know that the farther out you subdivide, even in processors, and when we try to de debug it, it gets more exponentially difficult, does it not? So let's not kid ourselves. Mathematically, right. the short term variables are easier to predict. Right, right, because it gets it gets more big, and anything can. I mean, you can have like uh, five wars in twenty years. You know. Exactly. Okay, so let's say in five years. Okay. Well, I would say that we do, 
And I agree with it, yes, because I do models myself, do I not? That's how I, I come up with my own ideas. The, my, my own ideas, though, I, do not, I, I, I don't think I even go as far as five years. What I, what I do try to do is try to address something that is now that would, would help ease the situation that we are currently in and get us in a direction maybe that would be no more than two years out. Uh, I don't even know how you could be, you, you can't consider yourself Austrian school, man, because that's basically the action. How many variables, you can't use math. I'm like, how the fuck you can't well, use Well, no, because not everything in Austrian school is that premise, though, Jonathan. You're, you're making it very blanketed. No, that, no, but that's one of the most important. It's that premise. They have, they have models, and the Austrian school does have counter-arguments. What I subscribe to is many counter-arguments that the Austrian school does present. Now, what, what I am also countering in Keynesian is that everything can be predicted and let's just roll the ball and have fun and, and in the meantime, people, people get hurt. It's the same thing that I argue against even Ron Paul when he tried to use a gold standard and said, look how price stability stayed. Well, let's, let's talk about what Ron Paul just said. He said from 50 years that he could show that price stability was equal. But you know what, Ron Paul? You didn't show it happened in year to year. Yes, in year one, it was this price. In year finale, it was this price. But guess what happened in the in-between? You had deflation and inflation of monumental proportions to what we have today. And do you want to fucking live through that kind of bullshit? Hell fucking no, you don't want to live through that kind of bullshit. That's why we go to rates instead of zero sums. We go to actual inflation rates. What are we based on last year? Not what I'm based on fucking 20 years ago which is what the gold standard tried to prove by using a peg of saying, look at price stability. Go live through that fucking time if you want to. I don't want to live through that kind of time. I don't want to experience 18% deflation and then go back up to 26% inflation. I don't want to live through it. <laughs> I think ne next time, I don't know if you guys will love me, but maybe I'll try to get my friend uh, to come here because he's very smart too, just like you guys. Uh, I, 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 I'm a babbling idiot, and I know it, but uh, the, uh, well, no, it's like for the purposes of, the, over here is generally an open forum, the, you know, the more the merrier, we welcome them, the primary thing, it, the primary rules here are A, can you make the schedule, B, can you be civil, and C, do you have thick enough skin to take somebody disagreeing with you? Aside from that, there isn't really, <laughs> I think you'll be able to pull her off, but I think uh, I would love to hear Marcel and him talk about it because, I mean, both of you guys are good with numbers and dates and stuff like that, so he'll be like, no, go, after World War II, we have 40 years of growth, and of course, not just, <laughs> that, 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 you know, I actually was going to send you a site on, 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 on uh, Twitter, but I was like, yeah, forget it. I mean, there's so many ruts, and actually, in between. If you want the least amount of ruts, I mean, it, it typically ended in, a, in like, these golden years. Typically, the whole world that was on the Allied side prospered. Isn't that ironic? Wow. Well, well, why was that? Well, because we went into massive amounts of production. I would say the city of Detroit is the most empirical evidence data that you can show about what the years was. They were, in, right after World War II, close to 2 million in population. They are now down to. to so yeah, Detroit's not doing too. As a matter of fact, the, the Detroit, is like their city planner, has this idea that they're gonna ask, basically strongly incentivize people to move. Mm -hmm. They're like, no, 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 you can't live out there anymore. No, no. You need to move in here, or you're not in Detroit anymore. You know. Exactly. It's because why Detroit was one of the biggest hubs of, of industrialization post World War Two. I mean, it's. it's yeah, but that, the thing that, that's the thing people are saying that it's not well. There's there's evidence as well for that, but they're saying that it like yeah, you have for, uh, post war production, but it doesn't scale out to like forty years. I mean, it's yeah, not you have forty years. There is no forty year golden year. I mean, from freaking nineteen, that would put us into the seventies, which was one of the worst decades we've ever had. Well, the sixties was one. Of I don't know. The eighties could really give it a run for its money in different ways. I know. That's why I said, look, post the 70s, we had per capita GDP exponentially grow. Right. Even at Clinton, it was like... Well, the Golden Age ended in the 70s, and then the Reagan comes oh, out. The Golden Age truly really ended at the end of the 1950s. Early 60s is the max I would give it. I don't know what economic model or statistics are going off of, because every economic statistic that I go off of, 
pretty much ends at the 1960s. And, and uh, everything else after that, we have massive ruts. We go into massive amounts of problems. Uh, and, and actually have to rectify it by 1984, uh, which was one of the worst recessions that we've had in this country coming off of the late 1970s that, that threw us into massive amounts of inflation. And, and not all of it actually has to do with, uh, there's many variables included, and that's what the point is. It is. Uh, Milton Friedman is very correct. The central banks had a lot to, to, a lot to say in how economics panned out over these years. And we have to be very clear on, 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 on economic policies that it did exist. But if you have massive amounts of production and your tax rates are high, things are great because everybody's employed a lot. Your, your employment and industrialization has been. Look at, look at what happened with the dot coms. Do you know how, I, how many people do I talk to today that say, I wish I could go back to the early 90s? How many people do I, I, I know that? I remember the early 90s. They're nuts. I know. But, 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 <laughs> but many, people, many people want to go back to that. It's just like these people that go, oh, the golden years of the United States. Look, we had a new market industrialization that spurred so much investment and, and, and created so many bubbles because a lot of what turned out in the dot-com, unfortunately, was, was a bust. I e. It was fluff. The whole industry was fluff. <laughs> Wait a minute, i.e., real data, Detroit and many other cities that prospered during industrialization post-World War II no longer are prosperous. Why? And, and they didn't even prosper in the, in, in, in the 60s. They were on a decline. It's not, and that's why I'm saying this 40 years is like, yeah, whatever, dude. It's not 40 years. And it, it's great when we come off an industrialization periods, whether it's under President Clinton or Eisenhower or whatever. The industrialization when we when we tap into a new market, and you know what? If we let's say let's say next year, 2012, which we don't look good right now, but let's say 2012, something new comes up. This is an unpredictable variable. A new industry is created. Obama will have a second term. Why? Because the industry will be created. It'll create an employment. It'll create services exponentially that now depend on that new market. In an industrialization, industrialization, and create a tremendous amount of wealth. People will be happy again. Now, how they execute it and how many bubbles they create is a different matter. Yeah, I'm gonna but, say it, it's at one there. Uh, you know, um, and nobody pays attention to this, and and some people have been bold enough to say it. But the reality is, one of the natures of the way things are done, especially in the U.S., is it's a bubble. Eventually, some point down the road. Things are going to change, and what works today doesn't work that day, and then the bubble starts to pop. It either pops slowly and painfully, or it just kind of goes, <laughs> but it, it's, right. it's going to pop. <laughs> I, have, I have two more things to say before I, I okay. feel like getting here. Uh, first, I'm going to tie that now when I was talking about the Constitution being ruined. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we're going to say, okay, well, you know, we had a Constitution, now we're just going to throw it in the garbage and make a new one. No. The, the reason I say we need a rewrite, it's because the changes that I would want to make are, are they don't fit in an amendment, and uh, it would need a little bit more than that. That's what I'm saying that we need a rewrite. Well, we need, I guess we need to get the specifics because I would say that Tenth Amendment candles all that are not going to write. Well, I, I, I'll give you an example of a constitutional amendment I'd like to see more so. I would like to see a constitutional amendment that basically states the federal government can't we put a limit on what the federal government can overspend uh, you know uh, you basically if it wa it, it's got to keep its house in order it's not going to spend my great 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 grandchildren's money just because it feels like it then what happens see that's kind of like the gold standard and then flexibility is what happens if there is a natural disaster or a war or something where the if there's truly a disaster and a sod like, like that, and it's the will of the American people, the American people could be willing to live under a 90% tax. Well, see, you have to be very careful with writing the Constitution. Oh, no, no, I, I'm not disagreeing. That's part of why I'm saying that should almost be handled like a second Bill of Rights. The big disagreement in the U.S. right now is that uh, there's loopholes that are being abused uh, in the Constitution, where it's not it's not technically unconstitutional, but many of the American people 
and some of the representatives feel that okay, technically you're not violating the letter, but damned if you aren't pissing and burning manure on the spirit. Uh, and it's things like that. It's well, like, okay... Let me finish his second point, because he said he had two things. So. Well, that's basically what I, what I want to say about it. Like, when you're rewriting it, you're going to go through like every section of it and make things more clear and more defined, especially like with the... Uh, with the, the First Amendment, and that I was telling before, that corporations are not people. And I was telling you, it's just like a car, like a corporation is an entity, a car is I an entity. I know, by law, do you know why, do you want to know why corporations aren't people according to the law? People are want to know. Even whether it's no, or not. No, no, you want to know why? It's because individuals didn't want their homes and their families as a liability. And so what we did is, as a legal schism, like a, like a little schism we created, it's, it's a buffer zone to protect individual interests that become their personal interests. In other words, in other words, what the corp, what is corporate property is corporate property. But let's, let's, what is corporate property? If you, when it comes to regulation, Jonathan, and taxes, there is no corporation because it gets passed in employees and the consumers. If you want to talk about suing them, it's in the defense of the individual. That's why. That's what you're confusing. No, no, I understand. I understand the corporations. I mean, yeah, you have uh, what is it, partnerships and sole proprietors and stuff like that. S corp. I'm an S corp. I am an S corp. And, and, and a sole proprietor is not a corporation. It's, it's just a, a pass through. Right. They're, right. They're, right. They're, right. They're, it's a sole corporation. I was saying there's a different form of business where you could get I and mean, you could get sued to lose your assets. Where corporations can't. That's, that's, right. that's, that's right. See, the, the right. The laws of corporations were created to protect the individual. You're using in the hmm. offensive. A, a, a arrangement when it's really created as a defensive arrangement to protect the, 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 yes. the individual. The corporation solely exists as a separate entity to protect personal individual inter, individual. And, and I would argue in that particular case, a constitutional amendment is not what you want. What you want to do is create a new class of corporation who is designed to be an offensive corporation. It's a new class, I mean, though. Yeah. The, uh, corporation is comprised of employees and then it's consumers. If you pass a regulation upon that entity, it is passed as cost to its employees and consumers. You cannot, that's what I'm saying, offensively. No, 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 no. I, what, I think what he's referring to, correct me if I'm wrong, John, it, uh, is um, there are certain things, like, and you know, uh, uh, what is it? Um, Colbert's been making fun of this. You know, the, the hula balloons he had to go through to create a super pact. Uh, and uh, and uh, to do that. Um, basically, uh, for corporations who their whole purpose is a separation from the individuals, but to be that type of organization, in which case their, their goal is not yada yada not to be a nonprofit, but to be that entity. Uh, then what what there's a basically the law is incomplete you have another need for a corporate entity or separate entity but we don't have a classification for it but that doesn't need a cause how about how about this we just we just get rid of the, cor the corporate income tax and therefore they have no more incentive to lobby politicians because they're no longer taxed no, we, they're why? Using, they're in American territory they're using our resources and they're using our laws and they should be taxed no, 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 his logic of the funnel through is that it funnels through direct, basically, uh, uh, all corporations would work like uh, um, an LLC, where, in terms of the revenue, and that it just, all of it funnels straight through exactly. to the people. You're not, you're not taxing the entity, Jonathan. No, I know, it trickles down, it trickles down, because you're taxing I See, people have this, this, this weird ideology that somehow the CEO gets all the money. No, no, no. no look, the thing is, the corporation, right? The corporation is a, a defense mechanism, okay? And the people are inside of it. And they're working together as a group to move yeah. something forward, move a product forward, or, you know, whatever, to further their goal. They're working as a group, and they're using the corporation as a defense mechanism. Right. And they should tax for using those tools. No, Jonathan! Why? Because you, are the consumer, at the other end, now get double taxed. Why should you, especially as a poor person, now pay dual taxation on the good that you really need? You just killed the poor person by increasing the amount of cost on that corporation as a corporate tax 
by beefing up the exponential cost of that product to that poor person, you just made it more expensive. Well, well no, it, it, like, what, what, what Marcel's getting at is basically when you price goods, and I do this for any time I set up an e-commerce site. You know, people tell me, I want to sell the goods for this much. And I go, okay, uh, no, 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 no. It's like the people who I get the best results on e-commerce, I go, how much does this cost you? And then, and then we add on top of that, okay, this is how much it's going to cost to do the online advertising. This is how much it's going to cost for your hosting. This is how we add every freaking cost in. And if there's tax, we add the tax in. If there's credit card fees, we add the credit card. You, you start with the costs. And then that tells you, okay, this item needs to be sold for this price. It's the costs that dictate the price. And that's what he's talking about. If you take the cost of the tax out, all the goods become cheaper. But well, I, and I, the, for I, some reason, I understand because that's uh, that's one of the things that happened uh, historically speaking. When there was no tax, um, you know, your products are available, and then uh, the lower middle class they weren't making as much money as the rich people, so they wanted to. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why would that be even the case? You know, we have we have come up with labor laws that I wouldn't do away with today that we are contending with. We cannot say that oh, all of a sudden now the, the poor people don't get hired or have a lower income. No, if we have no corp in corporate income tax, they have less incentive to lobby our politicians. They also we have cheaper products. They, they basically, I mean, what is a corporation going to do? Keep the, all the profits in some bank and it doesn't go to anybody? It's just going to sit there and rot? It doesn't go to the CEO? Some would. Most wouldn't. Jonathan, I mean, I mean Rusty, explain. How would that CEO transfer? Because if the taxes are on the individual, how would he transfer all that profit to himself? He would no, 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 no. I didn't say he'd transfer it to himself. What I'm saying is some people wouldn't pass the savings on. They'd just pocket it for the company. But and it's a funnel through, in which case it goes to the shareholders. But there are there are corporations where the board is the sole shareholders. Rusty, what is what do you mean by pocketing it? They can't pocket it because if, as soon as it translates to a dividend or or a, a, an employee as a consumer, like you're you're the you're the end product of it. It's taxed. I know that. You're taxed on dividends. You're taxed on as as the consumer. I understand that. What I mean is, uh, the, the, okay, uh, what, okay. here's what I'm getting on. The argument made on the trickle-down economics is that if you just get rid of this tax, let me finish, that if you just get rid of this tax, it will magically all trickle down. That's not necessarily the case because they may just choose to be more profitable as individuals. But then you taxing, but then you're taxing the individuals, so it's not like it's a tax dodge. You're not accepted, Rusty. Explain how that happens. If you have a corporate entity, which is a corporate bank account, how do they in profit themselves? They must transfer the wealth from the corporate bank account to their individual account. Yes. If they're saying, then they get taxed. I, I, I didn't say they won't get taxed. I'm and saying, they, all I'm pointing out is that it doesn't necessarily trickle down. Wait a minute, it does trickle down. It does fucking trickle down. You just missed it. You just tax them at a much higher value rate because they just transferred all that wealth to their personal income, which now exceeds many, 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 many brackets, which means the percentage of taxation that comes out of them is much larger than it would have before. And guess what? That contributes to helping poor people. What are you talking about? Uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, that's the bit I'm missing. How does our tax go to helping the poor people? <laughs> Wait a minute. Under current, are we not talking about current taxes? If we if we remove the current income tax on corporations, and you just said they're going to funnel it, the the corporate profits to one CEO, he gets taxed. Right? I didn't necessarily said one CP, CEO. I said to the shareholders, they could divide it between them. Oh, well, okay. Well, share. Okay, so what's wrong with what's with, what's wrong with transferring more profits to shareholders? that it increased their wealth positions. It doesn't mean... That I didn't... Uh, Marcel, right? you're, you're assuming I'm saying there's anything wrong with it. All I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily... Uh, okay, let, let me... let me, let me. me. Okay, let me... I, I have to talk on a hypothetical for you to follow what I'm getting at. I, 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 I sell a widget... I sell a widget for a dollar. Fifteen cents of the cost of that widget retail is to deal with the fact that I have to pay corporate taxes for selling the widget. If we get rid of the corporate taxes, 
It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to drop the price of the widget 15 cents. I could afford to, but it doesn't mean I will. If I don't, that means I have 15 cents more profit, which then will transfer directly to eventually a person, which then gets taxed. Right, which, which which means you just transferred your profit margin to dividends that go actually falls and then gets taxed on those dividends that go out. All I was like, pointing out is that because I, I pointed out the scenario before where I'm saying costs dictate price. What I was pointing out is the the idea behind trickle down economics is that taking that fifteen cent cost out guarantees the price will go down fifteen cents or they'll hire fifteen cents worth of workers. There's no guarantee of that. Here's where the missing factor is. A static one company can do that. But guess what? Its, com it's competitor won't. Oh, no, I know that. And it creates a new race to the bottom and who can get the now customers first. That's why we embrace the competition of each. Because you know what? Guess what? Okay, you decide to take that 15 cents per unit of product and make it go to your shareholders. You're going to be undersold because the profit shares existing already because you just, we just, we actually just vaporize fifteen cents. That means that you already had a certain amount of investors already in, interested in that company, and overnight, if we eliminate the corporate tax, they already had their separate projections for how much profits were going to come out of that company with older tax codes. So, okay, they can become fifteen cents per unit richer for the investors. I guarantee you that company is going to get undercut. Why? Because empirical evidence already has shown that it happens every day where companies will take the advantage and undercut the other because of the volume of getting that much more away from their competitors. And therefore, they pay the price. If you want to move your money to all your investors, guess what? Your investors will probably balk, because they're, or they may not. They, it, it depends on, on, on what kind of investor they are. Like I, That's why I couldn't stand Warren Buffett when Warren Buffett was, about, was, was, was advising Obama. I was like, what business does an investor have uh, advising our president of the nation when, an event, when he was talking about increasing the tax rates. An investor makes money whether the economy goes down or up. They don't give a fucking shit. Oprah right. has, no, has no reason to give a shit about the investors. Now, the thing of it is, is, if a company decides to take that 15 cents per unit to the investors, they will be undercut, and the investors lose out on that. They'll have to sell and scramble and do whatever because that company and their assets, they've just increased their value in per unit share will now exponentially decrease when the competition screws that company by undercutting them, which means they have a rapid exponential decrease in the value that they have just obtained, which will normalize if the company reduces its 15 cents per unit cost by becoming and regaining its competitiveness against its competitors, or if it chooses to be greedy, they will all lose out because they will, they will, they will maybe a few will escape, but I guarantee you the majority won't. And so, that's, where have, uh, that's where I have a problem with bailouts. Because the majority of investors, when it's an exponential decline in a company, cannot escape that fast. They can't turn their investments, the investments into liquid and transfer that quick. Oh, no, it, I, I agree on that respect. Oh, so I was... Saying, go, go ahead. A, a few can, but just to show you that it can't be done and to prove my point that people cannot transfer their investments to liquidity that fast, that's why the bailouts happen. Every fuck-up bank that screwed up and got greedy and exponentially played on us could not liquidate their assets fast enough to greedy. Oh, 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 okay, you're being a little harsh there, Marcel, because part of the problem there was there were banks that didn't want to play that game, but Here's for the, the but, but, but let, I let you make your point, let me make mine. But if, some, if, if I'm a bank and I'm only wanting to lend responsibly, and somebody comes into my door and I say no because lending to them isn't responsible and they just turn around and go across the street, that means I'm losing the business. So it, it, it's, you know... It, it, oh, no, I know. Wait, wait a minute. I, we, you and I agree that the, the government regulations created a lot of the real estate problems by forcing banks to accept what we call subprime loans. But... We can also not deny that while that was created by government regulation, that banks also exponentially started to create funds and get greedy on short-term loans out. Oh, no, no, dude, you don't want to know what some of my friends who were in financing were saying when all of that was going on. Oh, yeah. my God, I felt, I felt like taking a shower every time I talked yes. to them. A lot of banks got short-term greedy because it became very profitable money off the subprime loans. 
even though it was originally created by the government regulations to create the prime loans. My point of it is, is that, is that... How was the, the government's regulation to create a... Oh, uh, they said, they, it, it, was about, it was about housing. It was about housing, and I'll give you the act. It was about housing, they were saying... Yeah, they, they were saying that, it, that, that banks needed to loan at a certain rate for people that could not normally afford housing. This was to help address and put more poor people into housing that were normally... Uh, Beyond uh, their financial means. Uh, exactly. And so what they created was that it created more risky loans, what we call... That, that doesn't help anybody. If you're telling me I'm poor and I can't pay for shit, so lend me some money. Exactly. That was that was the idea. Jonathan, that's what happened. That's what the Democrats argued. They, because see, the, the government can't physically make those loans. They have to go to the banks, just like they do through student loans. They have to go through banks to give you a loan. And so the same thing happened with the housing industry. They made standards in the subprime market that banks normally wouldn't lend money out to. Well, this and connects to the this connects to the the FDR second bill of rights. There's the part where he's talking about housing. Everybody should have a house or whatever, right? Because we need a place to live, right? Yeah. So I don't think that the subprime loans would be the way to go. If the government was going to be providing housing for people, then it has to be a subsidized, and it can't be a luxury housing. It has to be some basic ass house. Yeah, the bank, the bank, yeah, the bank. But see, the, the, if you're well, no, and, and honestly, what you just brought up, the basic house, that's one of the things that created the idea that we needed that mentality. Across the United States at one point, there were uh, what I call starter homes, and what a lot of people call starter homes. They weren't great houses, but they were a starter home. You know, they, they, they were affordable. They were a place called start, you know, to, you, you could buy it, you could own it, and you could build your way up. Then we decided these were bad, you know, they, they, they lowered the value of neighborhoods because they weren't as nice as the houses across the street. So across the country, whole cities basically demolished their starter home districts uh, and replaced them with apartment complexes and... And, get it, and what was driven by that? Government regulation. Yeah. So at the end of the day, the home that somebody who was at that point in their financial climb, you know, basically they're, they're in, a, in many areas in the country, there isn't a, okay, I can afford to pay a mortgage equal to my apartment rent, but there isn't a house within 150 miles of here that's in that price range, and I can't afford the house that cost that 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 has a a mortgage twice my rent unless they give me a subprime loan that plays right, with right. everything yeah but let me get i want to get really back to my point with regard to that deal. my point is is that if that company gives its profits to investors investors cannot liquidate their assets fast enough to cash to become fat cats and my proof of that is all of the times that we have to, the government has stepped in to bail out investors and that is my proof that while the 15 cents increase in profit per unit translated to more stocks and value for those investors, they couldn't cash out fast enough. Y you know, I, I'm sorry. Wait a minute, Rusty, wait a minute. And so therefore, because they couldn't become fat cats, we should have let them pu be punished, right? Right, Jonathan? They should have, those investors should have been punished. Instead, right. protect them. It's a, little bit more them. it's a little bit more complicated than that, Marcel, because the problem is, though, that these corporations, they have too much influence, they're too big. Fail, basically. No, 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 I don't believe in the too big to fail. I, I am all for failure. There's nothing wrong with failure in my book. That's right. Let's talk about a bank No, no, no. They're not. That is myth about too big to fail. Okay, let's talk about a big thing. Wait a minute. I'm right, saying that I, I believe that the government would have loved for them to fail, okay? Because, I mean, they failed and you can't bail them out. It's as simple as that. But the problem is, though, that since they got too big, it's going to be a problem. So the solution to that is that I was telling you on Twitter, you can't let them get as big. That they, they're influencing so many sectors in the economy. Just have like small businesses. You know? uh, okay, I, 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 both the uh, idea of too big to fail and the idea that you need to prevent from somebody getting too big are wrong. There's if a big company goes down, there will right. th there'll be an adjustment. Prices will change, but the market yeah, will the react. Sector, people love it when, when big corporations. Oh down. God, when a big company yeah. fails, if you pay attention, you can get fucking rich. <laughs> Exactly like tow trucks on, uh, that's why there's 18 tow trucks to one car accident. It's the same fucking thing that happens. This too big to fail is such a myth. It's like these people are like, oh my god, what happened to my home? What does this talk about? It's like if the bank goes under and you still have a mortgage to the home, 
Does your home all of a sudden vaporize? Where does it go? No, 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 I, I understand and I agree with that. I'm my assets are all of a sudden gone. No, it's not. Your house is still freaking there. Right. What happens is that it subdivides into parts, and guess what? The big monopoly now becomes more competitors. Let it fail. This, this vultures of multiple companies will now come out, seize the assets, reevaluate the nominations and weights to value, and you're fine. It's, it's like, oh, they're too big to fail. What are you talking about? And, and, and honestly, uh, if we had let all of those institutions just fail, it probably would have done more to prevent foreclosures than anything else because the new investors would have understand what they were buying and they would have been interested in restructuring the loans to something that makes them money rather than foreclosing. Exactly. Instead, the government goes into toxic, toxic assets. They could have let smaller banks and other uh, interests and parties of venture capitalists coming in and say, okay, fine. You know what? This, these houses, even though the bank just failed, have value because people are willing to trade it. They're willing to sell that home. It has value because to some other person, that two-story home that has 3,000 square feet has value. I'm going to make a business and based upon that value and pick up the scraps at the bank. And guess what? Now, I need to keep that value going. So it's going to be my best interest as a company to make rates at the, at the interest of those people. Instead, what do we do? We did not punish anyone. Everybody got pissed out. No, no going to, they got a, a going to jail free pass. And guess what? They're going to make the same mistakes because they're going to come right back to the United States government when they do it to us again and we get screwed. And they're going to say, bail us out again because you did it to us before. And right. I can't stand that fact. I agree. I agree with that. My, as I said before, I wanted, I, I wanted, I didn't want them to get bailed out. I wanted them to, you know, go under because, you know, they, they, they were responsible. Yeah, but you just they're too big to fail. They're not too big to fail, John. They're not. No, no, no. I agree with, bail, with, with not bailing them out, okay? That's the first point. The second thing is, though, that I've been thinking about it more often, though, and I, I don't know, I mean, if, if it's the repercussions of what happens after it, it goes under. Um, like, uh, like let's say if all the banks have been doing something illegal, right, and then we let all the banks fail. They're not, they're not all going to fail. That's the truth. No, no, that, that's the thing. They wouldn't have all failed. What, right. what, what's, hap what, what's happening now, some larger banks would have bought some smaller banks. Uh, would have happened anyways. However, um, more, like he's talking, like Marcel's saying, a bunch of venture capitalists and, you know, like business people would have gone, hey, did you know that yada yada banks go and belly up and that it's all its assets are for sale at basically fire sale prices? Hey, guys, between us, do we have blah, blah? Okay, yeah, let's go into buy blah blah and figure out what we own, and you know, basically the the pillars of the community would wind up owning the community. And there's nothing wrong with that because then it's in their best interest. Holy crap, half our we own half our workers' houses now. You know what? Um, they're not gonna work for us if they're busy dealing with yada yada. Let's get this. Shit. It, it would have been the best fucking thing for everybody if this shit had just been allowed to implode like that. Well, and, and what Jonathan's getting at, okay, he's saying, all right, if we let them fail, here's the truth, Jonathan. What happened? And I forget there was a there was a movie made on TV that kind of covered this a little bit. What had happened is Geithner, under Obama, um, uh, uh, and and also there was who was the Geithner Bush? There was a guy. It was a Bush and um, Geithner was involved too. Oh, I forget their names now. They. What they did, Jonathan, was there was very viable and very functional banks going on. But there were other banks that were failing that were absorbing the subprime loans. And what had happened and what caused this confusion is that the government forced partnerships. They forced good banks to absorb the toxic assets of bad banks to keep them afloat. In other words, they took good assets from, from good functional banks that never got involved with subprime or did or managed themselves better and made them absorb much of the toxic assets. That's how Merrill Lynch got absorbed and others got absorbed into bigger banks. And then since the absorption happened, it created too much toxic assets on the viable banks, which wanted to make them all fail. That's the truth. Of the repackaging them or something like that? Yes. That is how this all started. If we were to let the original ones fail, the good banks would have picked up the slack. Instead, government gets involved makes everybody partner up and, and tries to spread toxic assets onto the viable ones, similar to taxation, too much of it, and, and jeopardize the entire program, and now makes the viable banks that could loan people out get weighted with more toxic assets, 
And what does this whole process do by forcing the banks, the good banks, to absorb It puts the bad a banks? freeze on liquidity is what it freaking does. There you go, Rusty. It created a freeze on liquidity. And we've had two quantitative easings by government central bank intervention to try to undo that. And there's now no way to reverse that process. No, it's just basically like what you're saying. We need a bit, we need a new industry boom to counteract the it, it basically. Right. We need something to invest in where what they're going to do is they have the existing toxic assets. The, the government is trying to use tax dollars to write off and absorb toxic assets, that's what quantitative easing does, essentially. It trades assets for more cash that we print to give to the banks to try to loan out. But, or trades interest rates that are long-term, uh, like 10-year bonds. They'll buy up bonds or, or you know, just to try to de de decrease the uh, return on the 10-year bonds to try to get the banks out of bonds and, and loaning out to the economy. This is what quantitative easing does. So we, until we have an industry or something that what will happen is they'll take those toxic assets. Those toxic assets will become part of a fund that is, is joined across many other funds. And as that new industry creates a bubble in investment, it gets written off and then eventually paid for at a lower rate because they attach it. They attach it as part of something that is doing well, essentially at a micro level. And it's at a much, much, much lower rate, but still they get a return at hopefully some sort of profit to the banks to recoup some of that cost, but they need a, a, a boom in some place to be able to do that because they have to get investors willing to take loans and people that they're willing to trust to give loans to, and or it's something so big in a boom that the banks don't want to lose out in that profitability and say, wow, this sector is so good. We normally don't trust anybody right now with our money. But because this boom is so good and we really trust this boom that's happening, we're going to loan out money to those people and they'll, and they'll be able to absorb the talks. They'll, they'll be able to write off. The problem with that, and I'm hoping that's not how it happens, is that's literally another dot com. Because usually by the time the banks get that through their right. head, it's, yeah. in the, it's, it's about ready to pop. <laughs> yeah, but so you tell me. How do you do it? You've already merged banks. You've merged assets. I mean, are you going to separate them? I mean, and then uh, honestly, at this point, me personally, I have given up on salvaging the banks. And what I'd love to see uh, is the uh, in the United States right now is I'd like to see financial services institutions that uh, basically provide the services that banks are too crippled to provide right now. Uh, and you know, basically, just on basic fundamentals, will will this loan help? Or are you just spending money you don't have? You know, it's like basically uh, venture capitalists get together and create uh, financial services institutions designed to provide the basic fundamental yeah. services that yeah. banks cannot provide right now for the reasons we just went over. And there's no reason you can't do that. You just have to be a licensed financial services company. You don't have to be a bank to provide those services. Wait, another, another, method, another method that could happen, which I know we were discussing in Glass Steel before, Anthony, is you know, the difference between commercial banks and investment banks. Both are risky. Your money is gambled in either yeah. direction. And, and but what, what the thing of it is is that is that what else could happen is that you could increase the interest rates. Now, if we had glass steel back, we would actually increase interest rates exponentially on homes um, for many people because if see that's the thing. Like glass steel wasn't repealed in total words. It, there was things that were backed off and, and amended. The, the, the thing of it is, is that the separation of commercial and investment banks, and, and J.P. Morgan is, is one that's trying to toggle between what they are. But believe me, Glass Steel has some provisions that are still in effect because J.P. Morgan right now is trying to, and I know this because I write programs also for financial industries that do stock analysis, and J.P. Morgan is one of the investors that's desperately trying to toggle between, well, I'm not an investment bank. I'm in a commercial bank. Or no, I'm an investment bank only. I'm not a commercial bank. You know because it's, well, that's, yeah, good luck at that. <laughs> that's what I don't like. That's why I'm for Glass Steagall because I don't want my. I, don't want yeah, I know. I know you're for it, but what I'm saying is, what would happen, and, and the reason being is why part of it was taken away, is you can increase interest rates exponentially and price more people out again at the market. Yeah, but I don't like banks. I don't like banks gambling with my money, and then when if they but they gamble with the money, but they're going to gamble with your money whether it's commercial or invest. See, the thing is, what you're telling me is that I I only prefer a certain amount of gambling 
Uh, in other words, you can gamble in roulette and blackjack, but you can't you can't uh, gamble uh, with the slot machines. No, the way that I think it should be is I put my money in your bank. Thank you for the service. You can't use my money at all. Simple as that. Oh, no, no, Dude, no, 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 no. <laughs> you do not want that. <laughs> it's a start. Uh, okay, first off, somebody's echoing. <laughs> no, that's a must. It means no fine. All right, if it's a must, 10% you can use, all right? That's it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Hey, hang on. Who's echoing? I don't know who's echoing. I I'm hearing both me and Marcel back through something. That's fine. Okay, it, it gone. There it goes. Whatever like it was. What, saying, what Jonathan just said is that that's a Muslim practice, actually, and, and where they don't charge interest. In other words, there's no borrowing against your money is your money. That's a Christian practice, too. I think there uh, isn't there a commandment in the Bible that says not charging interest or something? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, but I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not a Christian. I mean, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm not well, I'm not versed in that Christian aspect of it. But what I'm saying is that then how do you counter inflation? <laughs> No, we I'm invest. We invest in things that borrow against our money in the bank, so that we because the bank pays us back interest. Oh, uh, it, 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 Marcel, the interest the bank pays you is <laughs> not all. Well, wait a minute, Rusty. Okay, you laugh. All right, well, but you but you also take you also take your own money, right? And you also invest it in the stocks and the things which which you know are other uh, are other facets of banks and whatnot. The thing of it is, is that you can't just simply say, "I'm putting my money in a bank and that's it." Then, the, the, the Jonathan, you might as well just keep your money under your mattress. It does the no, same thing. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's that's the reason my mom she doesn't invest in like United States banks because they don't give you any interest. She just like she goes she go to Dominican Republic and put her money in a in a safe from well, not a safe as United States banks, but. For Dominican Republic banks, the same bank over there, she has much higher interest over there. Oh well, you can do that. Yeah, right? there's nothing wrong with that. That's an option. Yeah, banks, banks that do offer higher interest rate. That's you, actually. Yeah, that, that, and honestly, that's one of the things I missed. I, I liked the credit unions before they, they basically turned into banks. They were riskier, but you could get a much better return on cash you were largely just sitting around. But yeah, Jonathan, banks with high, usually higher interest rates on your checking accounts are riskier. It's because right. that's what I heard. No, no, and, 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 and I'll tell you this. Any bank in the United States, when they're advertising high interest rates or save as you go or yada yada, what that means is they're trying to uh, shore up liquidity cash problems and they need that money in the bank now. Yes, and that's what I was going to tell you. That's another way that they could liquidate the toxic assets is that interest rates are now going to go very high on what they want to loan out, and that's to absorb these toxic assets that were forced upon us by the government. So then how do you store your money securely without actually losing it? Your money is not insecure, Jonathan. If you let, if you let, if, if, I don't care. Jonathan, if you put your money in a bank and the bank fails, uh, it's insured up to... Um, 150000 yes. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, but let me, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. The, the, uh, 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 if everybody ran to the, had a bank run, that insurance would fall flat on its face. Oh no, yeah, that that is a little thing that most people don't realize is that insurance has been put in the okay. general fund. You can, you can, as a consumer, not participate in the banking system. You can keep it on your mattress, but you, your income will not grow. That depends what you choose to do with your money. My income grows rather nicely. <laughs> once you retire, once you retire, you're no longer employed. You you have a static set of money. Do you not? Or do you not uh, well, that depends how you retire. Some people are getting residual incomes. Can we be clear on the definition? When you cease to produce and earn money, can we agree on that? Okay, but I, half the people I know who are retired don't technically classify as retired because they're still earning residuals on stuff they did for 20 years. <laughs> uh, do they have pensions? Uh, no, I'm not referring to pensions. I'm referring to they... Um, Basically, they spent their money and worked very hard for 20 or 30 years of their life uh, in things that would result in residual incomes. How are they getting residual income without interest? I mean, what are they doing for residuals? Uh, they have ownerships in certain things. Or That's they, an investment, dude. That's an investment. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So what my point is, Jonathan, is that we, if, if you're a smarter consumer, if you take your static money, which you can keep static if you wish, and make it grow. Just because an investment bank takes it and does something with it, 
they actually can get introduced to you higher interest rates, which you were just saying. I want to get higher interest rates. If, if, because sometimes those investment banks do take it to the riskier places. If your mob's investing in other banks across abroad, they have higher interest rates, I guarantee you, because they are riskier. There is no way around it mathematically. A bank has higher interest rate returns because they need their own coffin. That's the entire purpose of it. And now, I, 